Good morning, everybody. Why don't we stand and uh, make a joyful noise? How's that sound?
Good morning, everybody. This is the fourth Sunday of Advent. Uh, the first Sunday, we lit the candle of hope. The second Sunday, we lit the candle of peace. And the third Sunday, we lit the candle of joy. Today, we will light the candle of love. One of the most well-known scriptures is John 3.16, which states, For God so loved the world, that he gave his one and only son, who, whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. This is the reason we have Advent, is the coming of Jesus to where he got to show God's love for the entire world. He, 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 he loved us so much that he sent his only son to die for our sins. Uh, so that is why we celebrate Advent season. That's why we celebrate this week especially is for the love that he shared uh, scripture is Romans 5 6 through 8 you see at just the right time when we were still powerless Christ died for the ungodly very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man though for a good man someone might possibly dare to die but God demonstrates his own love for us in this where while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God's people are those who, have, who believe in him, that he came and died for us and died for our sins. So, you know, are you, does his love fill, in, fill your heart? Do, can people see his love in you and shine through you? Are you willing to share his love with everybody? Let us pray. Oh God, we praise you for showing us your great love through this Advent season, the coming of Jesus into our world and into our lives. We pray that your love will fill our hearts to overflowing. Oh Lord, use me, use each one of us as channels through which your love can flow to many, many of others in our community. We are so thankful for your love. It brings us hope, which gives us peace bubbles into joy. Amen. All right, we have a few announcements. Uh, do you guys know Christmas is coming up? Anybody know that? Uh, we have a Christmas Eve service. That's the day before Christmas, if you're checking your calendars. Uh, it's going to be 6.30 uh, right here in this room. Um, bring your families, bring your friends, bring your friends' families. Um, it's going to be an awesome service. We're going to have Christmas carols and communion. And uh, Pastor Drome's going to bring us a, a wonderful message about Christmas. Uh, it's going to be great. Um, so we'll see you there, 630. Um, Washington versus Eagles game. That's, that's not today like dumb me thought it was uh, because we play the Eagles twice in three weeks. So I got confused. So that's January 2nd. Um, there is still time to sign up, I've been told. Uh, last week it said you guys had to have your uh, registration in. That is no longer the case. So if you want to go see Pastor Cliff or Rodney, he's that handsome guy back there in the red jacket. Um, and again, if they lose, I'll never forgive you. Um, 
And uh, <laughs> I might. I might forgive you. They're probably going to lose anyways. It's okay. Um, so uh, as we get ready to open up our uh, Sunday school, uh, the, it, as the new year rolls in, um, we're going to need more people. I've already had a handful of people come and tell me that they want to help and serve in children's ministry. And to those of you that have done that, I say thank you. And to those of you that are still on the fence, come talk to me about it. If, if you're nervous, if you're scared, there's no reason to be. The children are lovely. They're wonderful. They're not animals like like they're advertised sometimes. They are great. Um, so come talk to me or you can email me or at the church um, and we'll get you guys involved in that. Um, make sure you fill that out so we know that you were here because we love you guys and we want to know who of you we missed and who of you were here. Um, also, if you have your tithes and offerings, there's a few ways you can bring those. There's a little church building out here. You can just drop it in the little hole in the top or you can go to Facebook and click that blue button which takes you to a tab where you can give online, or you can go to our website and click that button at the top right that says online giving, takes you to the same page. You can use bill pay, you can use, um, uh, mail. you can send checks through the mail, um, you can drive by at Smoketown and throw your change out the window, we'll, I'll pick it up in the driveway. Um, however you guys wanna give your tithes and offerings, and, and you guys are, Pastor Jerome's talked about it, you guys are such a, generous giving group of people that cares about not only this church but the community around us so you guys are, are great in that sense um, and so without any further ado if the children want to dismiss towards the back um, and go down to rock and rock junior that would be great the children are heading heading to their worship service and we're glad for them hey boys and girls are you all excited about christmas all right you wave at me if you are okay Xandria is good all right well, I am glad for Christmas myself. I'm glad to be in God's house and thinking about the season of giving. And so I want to encourage you to continue to be faithful. You know, when we talk about giving, and I have bragged how the church as a group is generous, I want to encourage each one of you to examine your own heart. Are you? And you know, you can always leave it up to everybody else. Well, I'm glad they do that. Uh, but I hope that you're a part of it so you can feel good when you know the church is doing something because you are supporting. The church is always just as strong as its weakest link. So be a strong link in the chain. And speaking of all of the things that are going on, I want to underscore what Luke has already said about this uh, Thursday night. We're going to have, is, wait a minute. Thank you very much. I knew I was wrong as soon as I said it. Friday night is Christmas Eve, and we are looking forward to that service, and hope you will. Bring your friends and uh, come on in. Uh, we're going to be here about 55 minutes or so for a wonderful time, subdued lighting, and a uh, chance to sing some carols and and just worship together as families and, and uh, have communion. So I hope that you'll be a part of that and tell somebody else about it. Anybody can have communion that loves Jesus, looks for his coming. So uh, we invite you to come and be a part of all that. Also, I want to say a special word of thanks to those who have led our giving programs in the extra things that we do during the Christmas season. Uh, Kevin St Sandell uh, directed our shoebox ministry, and uh, you gave several shoe boxes and I'm so thankful for the children that were able to be helped through that. I'm glad also for the work that Bernie does every week all the time and especially during this season. Uh, Bernie Ammons has um, made sure that uh, people have coats uh, as they need them during this time. I brought them. I have two bags and one not in the bag. Is that okay? All right. Stand up Bernie. Good job. Let's give her a hand, folks. Amen. Amen. But I would also say everything rises and falls on leadership. If we don't have a leader, what would we do? And I'm so thankful that she has led the way on that. And speaking of that, I'm also glad we were able to give uh, a pile of gifts to children, 30 children uh, this week through the Christmas kids. And come on in just a minute, Mary. This is Mary. She's in that picture right there with the red stuff on. And she's over there sort of in the dark. But Mary, good job getting us together and helping us do all that. Let's give her a hand. Praise the Lord. Amen. I just, I think it's fabulous. And I know there's going to be some smiles that we help to generate through uh, giving those wonderful gifts, and I, I just think it's wonderful. And I get to say we because I'm a part of it, and uh, I encourage you to be able to say we to things like this as you share in it as well. 
Well, I'm glad you are here in God's house today and uh, want to pray that God will speak to us. This is, as Scott and Tony just told us, this is the weekend when we really celebrate the love of God. Remember that old song, how rich and pure, how measureless, how wonderful is God's great love for us. We're blessed people to know about it today. And so we're going to sing another song talking about how we love Him. So I, I encourage you, let's stand up and let's sing.
How's the lost world going to know about Jesus unless we show them? The Bible says the things of God are clearly seen in all of creation. But to really get down to the story and exactly how it applies to your life and mine, somebody needs to tell us. And so you and I are it. We're the appointed ambassadors. If we love the Lord, the Bible says we are now ministers of reconciliation. We are Christ's ambassadors. I just read this week that the president appointed a whole bunch of new ambassadors to countries around the world. And I looked at some of those ambassadors and I wondered really what their diplomatic credentials were. I've seen that some of them did things in sports or in business, but I didn't know what prepared them. We don't know but if they can have a good attitude and a good spirit, they can be good ambassadors. It's amazing. You don't have to have a whole lot of specific talents to be an ambassador. You have to just know how to take good care of people, how to help people, how to love people. And sometimes we find that hard to do in our own strength, and that's why we need today's emphasis, the love of God. We need God's love to get along with people. I love mankind. It's people I can't stand, some people would say. You know, and uh, we need to recognize that uh, people are the most important things on the planet. Jesus didn't die for anything but people. And the only thing that's going to last for eternity, people. So I want to encourage you to love people. So the fourth Sunday of Advent, we join Christians around the world celebrating the love of God and the promise of His second coming, which could be at any minute. We rejoice in the hope, peace, love, and joy of His coming, what He brings into our lives. So, Merry Christmas. Christmas. Right. We know what it's all about. We are blessed people. You ever notice how few people seem to understand what it's really all about? I mean, they got Santa, and they got reindeer, and they've got uh, candy canes, and they've got all kinds of junk, but they don't know the real story. And it's really not up to them to proclaim it. It's up to you and me. So, I want to encourage you. It's a wonderful time of the year. In fact, at times, I think I can smell it in the air, the smell of Christmas gifts. Or maybe it's just a smell of greed. It's hard to tell the difference. Uh, by the way, if you want to talk about giving and really giving some big-time gifts, did you know if you wanted to give your girlfriend the 12 gifts of the song, the 12 days of Christmas, it would cost this year $41,000 plus. So, you know, get out your 401K and uh, decide to give that. By the way, I found out that the meaning of the 12 days of Christmas is really impressive. In fact, I have it here somewhere. <laughs> it's, uh, it's amazing what this means. And it was several years ago, back in the 1550s to the 1820s, that Roman Catholics in England were not permitted to practice their faith openly. I think it was Henry VIII uh, wanted to marry and divorce and all that kind of stuff. And the Pope wouldn't let him, so uh, he said, fool on you, I'll start my own church. So he started the Anglican church there in England, and uh, so if you remained Roman Catholic, you were a hideout. You had to do it uh, under the cloak of <laughs> darkness, I guess. And so uh, they had to find ways to teach their children the Christian faith. And so one of the ways was this song, amazingly, the partridge in the pear tree is Jesus, First and last. You know, he's always the first and he's always the last. Two turtle doves, the Old and New Testament. Three French hens, faith, hope, and love. Four calling birds, the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Five golden rings, the first five books of the Old Testament called the Torah or the law. Six geese a laying, the six days of creation. Seven swans a swimming, the sevenfold gifts of the Holy Spirit, prophecy, serving, teaching, exhortation, contribution, leadership, and mercy. Eight maids of milking, the eight beatitudes, you know, blessed are the pure in heart, and so on. Nine ladies dancing are the nine fruits of the Holy Spirit from Galatians. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Ten lords a-leaping are the Ten Commandments. Eleven pipers piping are the eleven faithful disciples. And the twelve drummers drumming symbolize the twelve points of belief in the Apostles' Creed. So a lot was taught through that old song, and I never knew that until just recently. And uh, I just wanted to share that with you because I think when you sing that song, it may take on a different uh, whole feeling for you as you try to remember all that and go through it. So... Uh, 
Then, of course, that uh, 12 days of Christmas gifts, that would be a great plan if you had that much money. But did I ever tell you about my greatest Christmas gift? It came in July. It was my first boat. Oh, was I excited. I got that 15-foot puppy, and I got it loaded to the gills. I had my tent and my lantern and my sleeping bags and my food and my ice chest and all my Cokes and stuff and my kids and my wife, and we got in that little thing, and we stuck it in the water, and I'm not kidding you, it went about that far from going under. We had, it was, we call it the rub rail, it was right at the rub rail. And, and I floored my little 50 horsepower <laughs> motor, and it went a, tor- what do you call it, a turtle boring, eight miles an hour. And I'm out there, And everybody's just zing, 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 you know. Their wakes are laughing at me as they whiz by. I was never so disappointed. (laughs) What in the world have I done? Boo-hoo! I've gone from the thrill of victory to the agony of defeat in about three minutes. Uh, It was something else. I'm so sad. Everybody else has all the good stuff. And by the way, if you have or you have ever had kids, you've heard stuff like this. But mom! A cell phone, everybody else has a smartphone. I'm the only fifth grader without one. And it doesn't stop after elementary and middle school or even high school. How about this one? Honey, come on. You know all of our friends have those big flat screens. Come on. Or, John, my diamond looks so small. (laughs) No matter what we have, it always seems somebody else has more. And I know as we think about Christmas and getting gifts, can you remember a time when a friend of yours got a gift and you got jealous? Did you ever receive a gift for Christmas and go outside and find one of your best friends had just gotten the bigger and better model? Did that ever happen to you? Happened to me once with bicycles. <laughs> ever been envious of somebody? Oh, I'm the only one. Excuse me. I'm preaching to myself here, I know. <laughs> Even ever, have you ever been envious of someone who won a huge amount of money or maybe, you know, had a big inheritance and instantly had all kinds of money? Have you ever thought someone else who had it so good that you thought to yourself, man, I wish that could be me? <laughs> I remember years ago, I was at a traffic light, just having to think of this. And I looked across uh, the, uh, the intersection and there was this car, um, it was a Lincoln Town car. And I thought, oh, man, I love those. I'd like to have one of those. That guy is so blessed, lucky, whatever. I don't know. Wow, I love that car. And as we drove, I was about 35, and I noticed this guy was about 75, maybe older than that. And it hit me like a ton of bricks. I bet he's got some things he'd like to trade, too. You know, everybody, anything you have, by the way, anything you have, doesn't matter what you get, all it does is expose you to the next 15 levels or so. Did you know that? You get a bigger house, you just start noticing the next 15 levels. You get a boat, I got a, finally I got a bigger boat, and I loved it. I used it for many years. But it always just exposed me to the next 15. I, I've seen some yachts that would blow your mind. You might have seen pictures. I've seen the real thing. I've been, my little boat parked right beside it. I've been in places where if this was the, you know, the slip for boats, the boat would fill it, and my boat would be over here in the little corner. I was, I was at Pier 66 in, in Florida. That's uh, just a place, it's a marina, and it's got a big hotel with a, one of these glass elevators. And I was coming down the glass elevator because I'd been up on the spinning top thing, the restaurant that goes around and around on top, and I was coming down filming the marina. And I was filming all these great big boats, and then I came to this slip. It was almost empty. Oh, no, there in the corner was my boat. <laughs> and I remember saying, there's one thing different about my boat than all these boats. There's a person inside of that one. <laughs> My wife was in it, and all the rest of them just sit out there and let people stay in the hotel. I don't know. All I know is anything you have just exposes you to the next 15 levels. So how are you ever going to be content? How are you going to get to a place where you're satisfied with who you are? No matter what you have, no matter what you do, most of us feel there's a person that's out there ahead of us. And there's a person in the Bible who could be like that and probably is like that for most of us. I mean, this person is so way out there in front and above. 
Uh, it's, it's the one person in the Christmas story who received the most awesome blessing that has ever been received. She's the one person who became the most instantly highly favored person who ever lived. Who do you think I'm talking about? Mary, the mother of Jesus? Man, her blessing, her blessing was so great, an angel had to come and announce it. And not just any old angel, Gabriel, that's the archangel of heaven. And I'm telling you what, when he comes and talks to you and says you're highly favored, you are highly favored. You can read her story in Luke 1, 26 to 31, when the angel comes and said, Blessed art thou, highly favored. You're going to have this child of the Holy Spirit, and, and his name will be Jesus. Name him Emmanuel. When you think about all that, and he starts it out, Greetings, you who are highly favored. Wow. The Greek word for highly favored is charitu. And it means to cover with grace, surround with favor, or honor with blessings. Mary was highly favored. God loved her so much that he chose her to be the one to bring Jesus into the world. No matter what I would ever do, I would never come up to the level of Mary and that level of favor. Man, she is so special, I will always be in her shadow. She's at the top of the heap. She brought Jesus into the world. God has given her the most favor of all. And you know, that's exactly what the devil wants you to think. It's exactly how Satan wants us thinking. Somebody, even if you point all the way to Mary, somebody's got it and I don't. Somebody's been favored and I haven't. And I just have to jump ahead and bubble out here just a minute. I just never have liked it when I talk to a father who has several children and he says, this one's my favorite. Doesn't that kind of bug you when anybody does that? It does me. I got three boys. I love them all the same. They all got different talents. They all exasperate me and bless me in different ways. <laughs> but I love them all. And I believe God is at least as good in fatherly love as I am. Don't you? He loves us all the same. And so if he's promised to take care of me, he's promised to take care of you. If he's promised that Mary is highly favored, I believe you have to get a hold of the fact that you are highly favored because thinking that she's way out ahead of all of us in favor is not the way God sees it. There's another place in the Bible where we find the concept of highly favored using the same word as uh, in, the, in the location there with Mary. It's found in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 4 through 6. Ephesians 1, 4 through 6, even before he made the world, God loved us. That means you and me. He chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do, and it gave him great pleasure. So we praise God for the glorious grace, the high favor he has poured out on us who belong to his dear son. I was a sinner. I was lost. I was out to lunch, and he saved me. Praise the Lord. He has bestowed his favor on all who will say yes. Praise the Lord. The only thing that keeps you from having God's favor is your own little will. I've said many times, God is everywhere in the universe and the only place that can block his presence is you. Isn't that amazing? Little old pipsqueak us on this little daub of dirt called earth. And we can say no to God's presence in our hearts and lives. It's the only place where he can not be at times. And so I want to challenge you. Don't let that happen because he says you are highly favored. You're accepted by God. You are loved. I mean, I wrote it in big capital letters, L-O-V-E-D. You are loved by the God of the universe. And that's what Christmas is all about, one word, love. It's really about love. That's the culmination. Yeah, hope. Hope for what? Deliverance and all kinds of good stuff that would come somehow. How? And it would bring peace and it would bring joy. Why? Because it would be based on love. It's not because I want to be in charge and so I'm going to get all you people and set you free from somebody else so you can serve me. I'm going to take charge of all this stuff and I'm going to give you some new freedom so you can have it under me. No. 
This is the God saying, you now can become my children. Jesus is saying, you're my brothers and sisters. We're the family of God. Praise the Lord. I get wound up just thinking about what we have in this, and we take it for granted. Y'all sitting there, yeah, I got a roast on the oven. I wonder if Texas Roadhouse will have any people today if I can go straight in. You know, this preaching gig is a pain in the neck. Just trust me. Don't want to ask to have to do this deal. Because I preach to people week after week after week. Anywhere I go, 28 years at the church where I was. And you just wonder, do the light bulbs come on? Do the joy bells begin to ring? Does anything stir in our hearts? Because we really need to understand how blessed we are and not take this stuff for granted. Love. The love of God. Not the God that says, I'm going to punish you, burn you. Not the God who says, you throw your virgins off a cliff. Not the God who says, you got to, you know, beat yourself five times a day. None of that stuff. This is the God that says, I will die for you. I will give you guidance. I will walk with you. I will show you how to live. I will give you the peace and the power to do it. And I'm going to take you home to heaven because death is not the end. It is a doorway. Praise the Lord. That's love. That's the God I'm talking about. And we need to get really clear about something right here. God's kind of love and the kind of love we hear about in our culture, those are very different. God's love, what we hear about in our music and our media in every direction that you hear about love these days, is different. In fact, I took a, little bit, a few years ago I did this. I decided to preach about it this morning. I took the... Um, the biggest hits of the last 83 years, the biggest song hits. So some of you won't remember some of these. The older you are, the more of this you'll get. But it takes those hit song titles and shows the cycle of love from the beginning moment to the <laughs> maybe not so good ending moment. Here's how it goes. Hello, I love you. I know you can't hurry love, but I can't help falling in love with you. Hey, I think I love you. Yes, this guy's in love with you, so much in love. No, I'm crazy in love, addicted to love. All you need is love. I know it's a young love, but it's not baby love or my secret love. It's my love. So let's go to the chapel of love and experience higher love. Oh, yes, love is a many splendored thing, but... Will you love me tomorrow? Because mine is an endless love. I'm a prisoner of love. And I can't stop the feeling. So I'll be loving you forever. But he don't love you like I do. You've become a part-time lover. Do you think this is just a game of love? Then you need to stop in the name of love. I know love will keep us together, but I'm on a love roller coaster because you've lost that love and feeling. How am I supposed to love without you? Love is here and now you're gone. Oh, I just, I just had to call and say, I love you. I want you. I need you. I love you. I will always love you. <laughs> Surely, love will lead you back. So, I'm saving all my love for you, the best of my love. But where did our love go? Love is blue. You give love a bad name. Oh, forget you. I've got a love hangover because you loved me and I can't stop loving you. Well, that's the way it goes. That's the way love goes. You always hurt the one you love. Besides... What's love got to do with it? <laughs> so that's, that's kind of how the world sees it, right? <laughs> in fact, uh, I was, I believe I was sitting in the car by myself at a revival. I was preaching a revival somewhere, so I was away from home. And, and it was after the service, and I was driving back to the motel. And uh, hadn't been home, you know, for several days or a week or so. And this song came on, real haunting in the night. As I recall, I was driving by a cemetery, too, for some reason. That sticks in my mind. And so it's dark, cemetery, and, and I'm by myself. I hadn't seen my wife for a while. And, I, and, and, and Foreigner, in 1985, did this song. I want to know what love is. Remember that? 
I want you to show me. I want to feel what love is. I know you can show me. The world wants to know what real love is because it's a misunderstood and unknown experience in our culture. People say, I love my house. I love my job. I love my baseball team. I love my dog and I love my wife. And then they want to throw in, and I love God. I mean, what are they saying? I mean, it's all the same word, everything. You know, I love everything. Yeah, well, good. Who knows what they're talking about? So we really do need God to show us what love is. Because our love cannot compare to God's great love. God sent Jesus into the world because of his great love for you and for me. Praise the Lord. That's why John 3, 16 that Scott and Tony told us about this morning, reminded us of, is so big. In fact, let's just say it again. I'll put it up on the screen there. And let's just say it together. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. That's a big one, isn't it? Not die, eternal life. Woo! I think I'm sticking with him. And Paul shouts it. I love the way Paul rephrases it or restates it, however you want to say it, over in Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 8. He says, you see, just at the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. He didn't die for the saints. He didn't say to you, go clean yourself up and I'll die for you. He died while we were yet sinners. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. I don't know exactly how to say this, and especially to clear it up theologically, but Jesus says, greater love has no man than this, but that a man would die for his friend. Then Jesus goes out and dies for the people that were cursing him, hanging him on a cross. He died for you and me whose sins nailed him there. So he says something, and then he shows us something way beyond what we've got. You understand that? This is the love of God. So how do you respond to this kind of love, this kind of favor? You're highly favored. What does God want you to do with this love? Well, first of all, God wants you to look like you're highly favored. He wants you to look like it. I mean, you're highly favored. Look like it. If you know Jesus is your Savior, that means he's forgiven your sins. He saved you from eternity in hell. Praise the Lord. I can grin and smile about that. Oh, I know. Nobody goes to hell anymore. You know that, don't you? We use dial soap now, and we have smartphones. Nobody goes to hell anymore. Don't be divisive. Well, then you're going to have to go against the directives of the God who we believe came to earth and died on the cross and came out of the grave, and that's why we we call ourselves Christ ends, right? So you can come up with a new way of doing it all if you think you can rewrite things, or you're going to say, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. All roads don't lead to God. Everybody's not right. I don't care if Walmart has made famous, the customer is always right. They're not. You aren't. I'm not. I don't know the whole thing. But I'm glad I've got enough of it that I can feel like I'm loved by the God who is in control. And I think I'm going to follow him. Because I'm not going to get out of this thing alive unless he comes back first. And I better have some plan that looks workable. So if you just want to jump around and coexist and all that, sure. We're as Christians to love and coexist in a sense with everybody. But that's not what's being said by coexist. That's shut up about your religion and let everybody else have theirs. And let them go to hell. You see, we're not loving people if we don't tell them truth. If you're about to get hit by a train and I just sit there and watch you. I don't care very much, do I? But if I dive and show, shove you out of the way, one of the greatest love examples I ever knew as a little kid, probably six years old, crossed the river in a, a little town, but I know where the house was. It was right on the four-lane highway, big yard. Everybody went by that house and said, wow, it's wonderful. It's Dr. So-and-so. And then I hear that Dr. So-and-so's three-year-old daughter 
had wandered across the yard when he was out there working one day and into the street. And he ran, dived, knocked her out of the way, and got killed. She lived, he died. I'll never forget that as a six-year-old. Oh, wow. That dad loved his little girl. Jesus has died for you. Until somebody else comes up with something bigger than that, you ought to seriously consider what that means and how it should affect your life. And knowing that he's died, wants to save us from hell, and you've received him, it ought to make you have some joy. It ought to get up to your face. That's a song, you know, we sang a few weeks ago, that I got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Well, it needs to come out to your face, you know, make it up there. <laughs> got all kinds of things I can say about that, but I'll move on. <laughs> you have received his love. So you, you should walk a little lighter, hold your head a little higher. I've been highly favored. I'm a child of the Lord. Royal blood flows in my veins. I've been bought with a price. Somebody bigger than you loves me. You're probably wrong. God isn't. Praise the Lord. Your opinion I care about, but I really don't have to worry about because his opinion is, Jerome, you're worth dying for. You're worth me leading you every step of your life. You're worth me preparing a place in heaven and receiving you to myself that where I am you can be also. You're worth it. Do you believe that about yourself? I'm not doing some little pep talk here based on psychobabble. I'm talking about there is either a God or there's not. And if there's no God, you mean nothing. There's no way you can gloss it over. You're an accident. You mean nothing. Stuff world and swirl blew up and you came out of it. Okay, well, maybe in your farthest fast dreams that could happen. I always talk my joke about West Virginia. Did you hear about the tornado that went through there yesterday? Did $5 million worth of improvements? <laughs> That's a small comparison to what people say when they say all this happened by accident but if it did think about the what that means you're an accident you're the baby baby great 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 bazillion times grandchild of an accident how's that make you feel but if there is a god and i believe there is not only is all this created you are created and there's some purpose behind it and you got a few years to figure out what it is and i'm just here today to tell you he died on a cross and came out of the grave. Go listen to that one real close and get in gear with it. Figure out what it means because it represents eternal life. Praise the Lord. And you can know something about it. See, I can't, it's like trying to tell you how water tastes when you're real thirsty. I can't tell you. You have to find out yourself. And it's the same way with Jesus. But I can tell you this. You get to walking with him. And you'll begin to say, I have seen him, I have known him, for he deigns. That means he chooses, he condescends to walk with me. And the glory of his presence will be mine eternally. I, I know something about him now. I can't share that with you. I can just tell you about it. you got to experience it yourself. But I want to encourage you. Look like you're highly favored if you are. If you've been saved, he's blessed you, chosen you, adopted you. You need to believe it till it shines on your face. God wants you to look like you're highly favored. And God wants you to live like you're highly favored. Can you imagine how, how confused, disappointed, embarrassed? It just would be confusing is the best word. If the Bible told us later on or history told us later on that Mary went into, after having Jesus, went into a life of sin and shame. What if we heard, you know, well, she had Jesus, and then after she got him out of the house, she became a prostitute, and, I mean, she died of herpes or syphilis or something somewhere. I mean, we all know. Ah, it just makes you cringe, you know. We don't even think about that. Why? Because she was highly favored. We want to believe she lived a good, holy, godly life. Well, Christian... Christ in, you have been chosen to receive his grace and reveal it to others. Now, don't misunderstand this word chosen here, like he picks and chooses. Remember, I already told you about the Father, even, all of his, everybody on the planet, even. And when it says chosen, what it means is way back before time even began, he chose, he decided, he predestined that those who came to him would have eternal life. Do you see how that works? Don't get this word messed up in some kind of theological well, I wasn't chosen, I guess. No, you've been chosen. The question is, will you choose? Because he's not going to make you. That's what love is. He's not going to force you to love him. That would take all the joy and juice out of it. If you made somebody love you, that wouldn't work. 
God wants you to choose. Mary was highly favored. We want to believe she lived a godly life. You've been chosen to receive His grace and reveal it to others. God and lost people want you to live like you are highly favored. I'm telling you, lost people want to see Christians. They want to see real Christ ends. They want to see it. They hear about it. They still like Jesus, but so often they can't find one. We uh, don't blow our cover in their presence. I want to encourage you. Let the lost world know who you are by living, looking like you are highly favored. Number three, God wants you to love like you are highly favored. Read these next two verses in 1 John 4, 11 and 12. 1 John 4, 11 and 12. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God's love lives in, God lives in us and His love is made complete in us. Highly favored ones need to love God with the bold love of God, a love that shows it's bigger than human love. It's God's love. Verse 12 there says, no one has ever seen God. The only way they can really see God is if they see Him by His love in you. Can they see it? I think Scott asked that question earlier. Can they see it in you? God has decreed, He has ordained, He has decided before time that you and I should bring His supernatural love into the world. Not some, you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours kind of love. Anybody can do that. The love He wants you and me to bring into the world is a love that loves the unlovable, serves the unthankful, reaches the uninterested. That's God's kind of love. That's the kind of love God shows that, that shows God's living in you. 2,000 years ago, Mary was highly favored because she was the one to bring Jesus into the world. Today, you and I are highly favored by God because we have been chosen by God to bring Jesus into our world. Will you do it? It seems that very few people today ever see or feel that we Christians act like we're supposed to act, that we're special in some way. All that most of them ever see is a bunch of dried up, shriveled people who call themselves Christian, plugging away at their faith like it's a job. Who needs that? Even in the Old Testament, God says, you think I want these sacrifices and all this junk you folks are doing? The true sacrifices of God are a, a, a right spirit and a contrite heart. A spirit that is visible, actually. It's feelable. God doesn't want system and ritual. He wants you in your heart. Anybody like your steak medium parched or well dry? No. No matter how you like it from, you know, rare to well done, you still like for it to be juicy. A few weeks ago, I talked to you about being a juicy Christian. Are you? You might say, well, I've attended Woodbridge Church of the Nazarene for years. To that, God, a lost world, and I would say, big deal. If God's love fills your heart, let it flow out of your life. Show me the juice! That's what a lost world's saying. I want to know what love is. I want you to show me. So does God's love fill your heart and flow out of your life today? Are you a dried up or are you a juicy Christian? Which are you? We're going to just think about it. Just bow your head with us. Let's think for a few moments. What are you? Why are you here today? Because your mama made you? Because you always have done it? It's a big tradition around our house to show up at church. Well, I've got to fill up some time because I have such a boring life that I have to come to church to fill up some of it. Or do you say, no, I'm here because I want the love of God to fill my heart. The verse of Scripture that I got over in this that I really want you to hear is the first part of 1 John there where it says, this is love. Not that you love God. But that he loves you. I mean, anybody that would see or sense God would say, I've got to love him. But he loves you. And that's why we ought to love one another. God loves us like that. Wow. 
how to just lower my eyes. So I want us to just contemplate it. Is Jesus' love real in your heart today? I'm not griping at you. I'm trying to challenge you like I told you in the beginning of my time here with you. I'm like a coach. And I'm also big on litmus tests. If this is the way it ought to be, where are you? Is it happening in your life? Be honest with yourself and God because that's what's going to end up ultimately happening. It's going to be you and God standing there. You're standing in front of Him. And you'll know. You'll either have peace or you'll know. No, I don't have it. Why not find that out, figure that out, do something about that now? Maybe you're even one who would say, I'm a Christian, but you know you've let the juice drain out. You, you know, we're leaky vessels. We need a constant infilling and filling up. My little car out here has to go to a gas station every once in a while. I don't think it's imperfect. It's a necessity of and a natural course of using the gas. It's that way in our spiritual lives. We have to have a constant filling. Sometimes we need a whole reset. Okay, fine. Take your phone and restart it. Take your heart and life and restart it in Jesus. Get a retouch, a new, fresh touch. Or maybe you've never really come to know Jesus. Man, what a better time could you ever find than Christmas. To say Christmas 2021, my life changed for eternity. Why? Because I allowed the God who has loved me since before I was born, since before time began to finally come into my heart and my life in his fullness. Forgive me of my sins and empower me to live a way that gives me peace with myself and with God. And then I can have peace and love with people around me. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. With your head bowed, just talk to the Lord. And we're going to sing. You can keep your heads bowed. We'll, we'll sing it. It's just simple words. We change the words on the uh, on the song, Oh, Come, Let Us Adore Him. And uh, we're just going to ask, tell the Lord that we love Him. And let's just talk to Him. Lead us on it, uh, Luke, and let's just talk to the Lord. think about God's love and the challenge to let his love flow through you. Just talk to the Lord right now. Maybe if you want to come around the altar, you can do that. If you want to pray where you are, kneel where you are, just talk to the Lord. What's the vital thing in your life? You may say, well, you're, you're an old guy. You don't know anything. I can pretty much tell you anything you're going through right now. I faced in some level somewhere along the line. I'm as old at least as most of you and older than most of you. And I've seen some big stuff, gone through some things. I've had great joys and great highs and I've had some lows. But God has been with me. When I gave my heart to the Lord when I was 19, things changed. And I'm so thankful. And I want the joy of knowing His favor to flow out of my life. When I come to the end, I'll have peace. And I hope that you will be wise enough to learn from the lives of others around you. Learn from the mistakes people make so you don't have to make them yourself. And learn from the positive experiences of people older than you, more experienced than you. Be wise in how you observe and how you make decisions because you got one life. It's moving fast. 
and you're one day going to face the God who made you and loved you and died for you. Are you in right relationship with him? You say, well, how can that happen? Well, the Bible makes it really clear and simple. Confess your sins. Just say, Lord, I know I'm a sinner. Forgive me. It hasn't really been my desire to run from you or be disobedient. It's just been the way I am. But I ask you to change that. Forgive me and come into my heart and give me power to live for you. Begin to grow as a Christian and know what it means to experience the great high favor of God, the love of God. Thank you, Jesus, for hearing my prayer. I trust and believe you. Let's sing that chorus one more time. Oh, let your love flow through me, Christ the Lord. Make it your prayer. Make it your prayer. If you know the Lord today, make this your prayer. Oh, let your love flow through me. Oh, let your love I thank you for the privilege to be people who have heard your message, who have experienced your love, who celebrate your presence in our lives and know that Christmas has really happened in our hearts so we can go into our world with a joy, a peace, a hope, and most of all, a love that they desperately need. Think about all the concerns in our world today, and we're so glad, Lord, that we know the answer. One by one, people can find what we have. Hope, peace, joy, love. Thank you, Lord. Go with us and use our lives to your glory, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. I'd like for our person who's coming to bring the benediction to come. And Rebecca, praise the Lord. And while she's coming, I want to remind you that we are looking forward to the Sunday, January the 16th, which will be the first Sunday with our new pastor, Pamela Fontana, and be praying. She's excited and planning to be here and uh, help a little bit in the service Thursday night, um, our Christmas Eve service. So I just say, praise the Lord, and we ask you to be praying for her. God bless you. Rebecca. Friday. Friday. <laughs> See, I just make sure y'all are paying attention. That's right. At that moment, the first heavenly messenger was joined by thousands of other messengers, a vast heavenly choir. They praise God. To the highest hopes of the universe, Glory to God, and on earth peace among all men, people, who bring pleasure to God. As soon as the heavenly messengers disappeared into heaven, the shepherds were buzzing with conversation. Let's rush down to Bethlehem right now. Let's see what's happening. Let's experience what the Lord has told us about. So they ran into town, and they eventually found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in the feeding trough. After they saw the baby, they spread the story of what they had experienced and that what had been said to them about the child. Everyone who heard their story couldn't stop thinking about its meaning. Go tell the story. In order for you to be a blessing to others, you have to tell the story. People must know. <laughs>